Good morning. Welcome to Northwest Bible Church. We're glad you joined us this morning uh, for our time in God's Word. Uh, behind me are some decorations for our Vacation Bible School. Uh, we're doing a virtual Vacation Bible School this year because of the um, pandemic and the schools being closed down, etc. We don't have access to Enumclaw Middle School, where we've held our VBS for the last number of years. So we're going to be doing it virtually, uh, doing a lot of recording in the next two weeks of all of our station leaders. And it's going to be really interesting uh, and exciting time for us. Right now in the month of May, we're right in the middle of our Vacation Bible School auction. Uh, we did our flower auction a couple uh, weeks ago. We're right in the middle now of our live auction online at our Northwest Bible Church VBS page on Facebook if you want to go take a look. Uh, really appreciate all of those who donated items uh, as well as those who have bid on those items. We really appreciate um, all of the investment in our VBS program. Uh, and so we're looking forward to that uh, this summer, the last week of June. Uh, lots of our children and families around the Enumclaw Plateau area, the Buckley and Black Diamond and even Maple Valley area, uh, will be able to do our VBS virtually at home. And uh, all those gizmos and Bible buddies and all the things that they normally ha pick up at VBS during the week, we're going to be getting to them so they can enjoy it together as a family at home uh, during that last week of June. So continue to pray for our VBS program. Uh, we It's our huge outreach event every year, and so we're really appreciative of all the people that have been involved in that. So I really appreciate that. This past number of weeks, we have been looking at the subject of living on purpose. We looked at living courageously. We looked at the subject of living sacrificially last week, living humbly. And this week, we're going to take a look at another one of those um, topics. I thought about calling it living quietly, uh, but that didn't seem to fit perfectly because uh, when we think of quietly, we think of volume. And that's really not what uh, living quietly is all about. So I chose to changed the title just recently. I decided to call it Living Reverently. And we really take a look at uh, Paul's words in Philippians chapter 2. If you have a Bible, I encourage you to get it and turn to Philippians chapter 2. And let me just, which is our normal rhythm, let me just read the text for you. I'll put it on the screen too, uh, but I do encourage you to take your own Bibles and, and read along and, and uh, be able to even write some notes in the margin if, if you, that's if that's your habit. That's a that's a good habit to be into. Uh, but let me just read uh, from the text of Scripture, Philippians chapter two, beginning at verse uh, twelve. Therefore, my dear friends, as you have always obeyed, not only in my presence, but now much more in my absence, continue to work out your salvation with fear and trembling, for it is God who works in you to will and to act according to his good purpose. Uh, let me just break into the text and have you notice a couple things. We are to work out our salvation and God is at work in us. It's a partnership what God is doing in our lives. And so we do some work and God is at work, enabling us to act according to his good purpose, it says. Verse 14, do everything without complaining or arguing so that you may become blameless and pure children of God without fault in a crooked and uh, depraved generation in which you shine like stars in the universe as you hold out the word of life in order that I may boast on the day of Christ that I did not run or labor for nothing. But even if I am being poured out like a drink offering on the sacrifice and service coming from your faith, I'm glad and rejoice with all of you. So you too should be glad and rejoice with me. Let me just pray for us as we dive into the word. Father, thank you again for the living word. Thank you that it is alive and powerful. It is sharp. It can dive down to the deepest motives of our heart, to our most darkest thoughts that we think we give kept secret. Lord, the word exposes those things. Thank you for its life-altering truth. And Lord Spirit, do in us for yourself what is best. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. 
Living reverently. Let me, let me just define reverently for you. Reverence is a feeling of awe, of deep respect, tinged with awe. Some synonyms I found for the word reverence, admiration, adoration, approval, devotion, esteem, honor, love, loyalty, praise, respect, veneration, worship. Reverence is a response of the believer's heart to God in the grace that God has shown to us. And the Apostle Paul, in his writings, uses this term often. In 2 Corinthians chapter 7, verse 1, he says, Since we have these promises, dear friends, let us purify ourselves from everything that contaminates the body and soul and spirit, excuse me, perfecting holiness, notice, out of reverence for God. In Ephesians chapter 5, the apostle writes this, Be very careful then how you live, not as unwise, but as wise, making the most of every opportunity because the days are evil. Do not be foolish, but understand what the Lord's will is. Do not be drunk on wine, which leads to debauchery. Instead, be filled with the Spirit, speaking to one another in psalms, hymns, and spiritual songs, singing and, and make music in your heart to the Lord, always giving thanks to God the Father for everything. In the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, notice, submit to one another out of reverence for Christ. The Apostle Paul also wrote the letter to the Colossians while he was in prison in Rome the first time. He wrote Ephesians, Philippians, and Colossians all during that time he was in Rome. In Colossians, there's a very similar uh, exhortation in chapter 3, beginning in verse 15. Let the peace of Christ rule in your hearts, since as members of one body you are called to peace. And be thankful. Let the word of Christ dwell in you richly as you teach and admonish one another with all wisdom, and as you sing psalms, hymns, and spiritual songs with gratitude in your hearts to God, and whatever you do, whether in word or deed, do all in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God the Father through him. You'll notice the theme of gratitude all the way through these texts of Scripture. Wives, submit to your husbands as fitting to to the Lord, in the Lord. Husbands, love your wives and do not be harsh with them. Children, obey your parents in everything, for this pleases the Lord. Fathers, do not embitter your children or they'll become discouraged. Slaves, or we could say today, employees, obey your earthly masters, your bosses, in everything and do it not only when their eye is on you to win their favor, but notice, with sincerity of heart and reverence for the Lord. Paul goes on to say, whatever you do, work at it with all your heart as working for the Lord, not for men, since you know that you will receive an inheritance from the Lord as a reward. It is the Lord Christ you are serving. The Apostle Peter says very similar words to what we just read from Colossians chapter 3. Peter says, Wives, in the same way, be submissive to your husbands, so that if any of them do not believe the word, they may be won over without words by the behavior of their wives when they see the purity, and notice, the reverence of your, wife, of, of, of the, your lives. What does it look like to live reverently? You know, I think it's probably best if we go back to the very beginning, since this idea of reverence is found throughout the scriptures. And let's look at the Lord's design for us as his image bearers. If we go back all the way to Genesis chapter 1, 
we see where God makes this statement about creating us in his image. Genesis chapter 1, verse 26, Then God said, Let us make man in our image, in our likeness, and let them rule over the fish of the sea and the birds of the air, over the livestock, over all the earth, and over all the creatures that move along the ground. So God created man in his own image. In the image of God, he created him, male and female, he created them. The next chapter, Genesis chapter 2, focuses our attention on that event. And it gives us just a little bit more detail. Chapter 2, beginning in verse 15, The Lord God took the man and put him in the Garden of Eden to work it and to take care of it. And the Lord God commanded the man, You are free to eat from any tree in the garden, but you must not eat from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, for when you eat of it, you will surely die. The Lord God said, This is the only time in the creation story where something is not good. The Lord God said it's not good for the man to be alone. I will make a helper suitable to him. Now the Lord God had formed out of the ground all the beasts of the field, all the birds of the air. He brought them to the man to see what he would name them. And whatever the man called each living creature, that was its name. So the man gave names to all the livestock, the birds of the air, the beasts of the field. But for Adam, no suitable helper was found. God said it wasn't good that Adam was alone. And so God put together a visual and experiential experiment for Adam, naming the animals as they came to him in pairs. Adam realizes all of creation has a, a complementarian pair. So the Lord God caused the man to fall into a deep sleep, and while he was sleeping, he took one of the man's ribs and closed up the place with flesh. Then the Lord God made a woman from the rib he had taken out of the man, and he brought her to the man. Now, this isn't the most romantic thing I think you, you, that Adam could have said, but nevertheless, this is what the scripture says he said. The man said, This is now bone of my bones and flesh of my flesh. She shall be called woman, for she was taken out of man. For this reason, a man will leave his father and mother, and be united to his wife, and they will become one flesh. The man and his wife were both naked, and they felt no shame. Now, now the reason I've read all that for you is so you can clearly see that even in the beginning, God made us as his image bearers to reflect his glory. And he made us in his image as male and female. And as male and female being made in his image, we reflect God. Men are designed to reflect the masculine characteristics of God. Women are designed to reflect the feminine characteristics of God. So when we talk about living reverently, it will be different for men and it will be different for women because to honor and respect and praise synonyms for reverence, the Lord God with our lives, we must do it in connection with how we are made as men and as women who bear his image. So I'm going to ask the question, how do we as men and women live reverently? As a, as a man, how do I live reverently? How would God want me to honor his design 
for me as a man? What are the biblical mandates for men found in Scripture? And as I look through Scripture, I find five of them. First, I am to be responsible or to be the responsible party. As a man, I am to lead. I am to take responsibility for not only myself, but those God has entrusted to my care. My wife, if I have one. My children, if God has so blessed. When I stand before the Lord, I will give an account on how well I took responsibility for their care. Secondly, I am to be under direction or I'm to seek his direction. I'm to seek not only God's direction for my life, I'm to, to seek his direction for the life of my family, if God has so blessed. And if I'm not seeking the direction from God and subsequently not following that direction, why in the world would any woman follow me? No one wants to follow someone who doesn't know where he's going. And no one wants to follow someone who's not under submission to someone else who knows more and is farther down the path than he is. The third mandate or the third way that I live reverently as a man is I provide sacrificial leadership. As men, we are to make decisions based on what is best for those we are responsible for. We saw last week that whole idea of living humbly. We are to seek what is best for the other person as more important than what's best for me. We choose, not based on what's best for us as an individual or based on what we want to do. We choose what is best for those that we are responsible for. Paul says it very clearly in, in Ephesians chapter 5 that I am to love my wife the way that Jesus Christ loved me. And he just doesn't leave it there undefined. He says, Jesus gave up him, his very self, his very life for the church. And I'm to give up my life for my wife, for my family, my children, and for my extended family. As men, part of living reverently is living sacrificially and leading in that way. Fourthly, I am to be the protector. As a man living reverently, we are to be the wall behind where others find their safety. We are to be the warrior, the refuge, if you will, for our wives and our children. We are called to protect the hearts, the minds of those God has called us to serve and to sacrifice for. Fifthly, we are to provide. We are to work. Work is not a curse. Now, work has been cursed, but work itself isn't the curse. We are to provide for the physical needs of those under our care. As a matter of fact, the Apostle Paul said to Timothy in his first letter to Timothy, if anyone does not provide for his relatives, and especially for his immediate family, he has denied the faith and is worse than an unbeliever. As par part of being a provider isn't just the physical needs. As a man living reverently before God, I am to provide the spiritual nourishment for those under my care. This means that, gentlemen, you and I, we have to get to church. When churches are opened up again in our state and we can actually come, we need to come and we need to bring our family with us. And by the way, you need to bring your Bible. You need to set that example. We are to engage our family members spiritually 
making sure that they are growing and learning and following our example. Those are just a few of the mandates that the Bible has for men, and, it's that, and that is how a man is to live reverently before God, honoring and respecting God's design for him. Ladies, how do women live reverently? How does God desire you to honor his design for you as a woman? What are the biblical mandates for women found in the scripture? And may I just mention a couple? And if we go back to Peter's words, I think it's pretty obvious. Peter said, wives, and, and I know some of you aren't wives, but just in case you are, this is addressed to you. But I think this is addressed to women in general as well. And I'll explain how I believe, why I believe that's true. Wives, in the same way, be submissive to your husbands, so that if any of them do not believe the word, they may be won over without words by the behavior of their wives. When they see the purity and the reverence of your lives, your beauty should not come from outward adornment, such as braided hair and the wearing of gold jewelry and fine clothes. Instead, it should be that of your inner self the unfading beauty of a gentle and quiet spirit, which is of great worth in God's sight. For this is the way the holy women of the past who put their hope in God used to make themselves beautiful. Now, obviously, what Peter says here, there's a cultural context there. Uh, it was in the first century a, a tradition of the wealthy to show off their wealth by having their hair done and actually sprinkles of gold in it and they wear all kinds of gold jewelry and clothes and and that's how they found they found their significance peter's saying that there's that's not how we find our significance as followers of jesus so let me just mention a few of the ways that you can live re reverently before god as a woman reflecting his image first of all as a, as a woman living under, living reverently, place yourself in submission to God's authority structure. Now, ladies, you are to be cared for. You are to be provided for. Ephesians 5 says your husband or, or your father or, or the men in your life are to nourish and cherish you, to provide for and protect you, whether you're married or not. God has established your role, and that role, according to Genesis chapter 1, is to be a helper of men. And trust me, we need the help. And we as fathers, as brothers in Christ, are to lead, provide, and protect for you spiritually, emotionally, and physically. So please, allow us to do our jobs, okay? Secondly, to live re re reverently as a woman, you are to respond to godly leadership. This is for your good. Men are to lead. Now, I know this sounds patriarchal, okay? But you are to tuck yourself in behind us as we take responsibility for your welfare. And, and again, I know this isn't politically correct. I understand that. But that's what God's Word says. And His Word is His truth. God's design for men is to protect and provide. And ladies, your design is to nurture. Third, and I'll take some time developing this one, you are to develop a gentle and quiet spirit. Peter says that. The word Peter uses for gentle has in mind the idea of strength under control. Gentleness is not weakness, but a strength 
to accept God's plan as good, and as a result, you don't resist or fight God's chosen path. But what about this quiet spirit? Did you notice that it didn't say quiet mouth? This isn't saying that you're to remain silent at all times. That's not what he's saying. This is a quietness of spirit. Let me think, let's think through that for a second. In Matthew chapter 11, Jesus makes this very well-known statement. Come to me, all you who are weary and burdened, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle, there's our word, and humble in heart, and you will find rest for your souls. So there is a burden that the Lord is referring to here that he really doesn't identify, but it's a, it's a heaviness. It's a weight that we carry that he wants to relieve us from. And then he says that he may give us rest for our souls. The Apostle Paul says something fascinating in the fourth chapter of Philippians. Rejoice in the Lord always, and I will say it again, rejoice. Let your gentleness, there it is again, be evident to all, the Lord is near. Do not be anxious about anything, but in everything by prayer and petition, with thanksgiving, present your request to God. And the peace of God, which transcends all understandings, you can't even explain it, will guard your heart and your mind in Christ Jesus. This is the quiet spirit that Peter is referring to. This describes what has been called the exchanged life. You exchange your fear for his confidence. You exchange your anxiety for his peace. You exchange your discontentment for his rest. It's the exchanged life. And as a result of his strength within you under the control of the Spirit of God, it is not your mouth that is quiet, it is your soul that is unagitated. It is at rest. You have confidence that is centered and focused in the Lord Jesus Christ because your hope is in Him. You don't let the enemy push you around because you know that you're strong in Him. You have fathers and you have brothers that will fight for you. So what is the foundation of living reverently? Isn't acknowledging that Jesus Christ is who he said he was, the almighty God of the universe, the sovereign, the all-powerful, the all-knowing, God who loved you. I love what the Apostle Paul says in Romans chapter 8, beginning at verse 31. What can we say about such wonderful things as these? If God is for us, who can ever be against us? Since God did not spare even his own son, but gave him up for us all, won't God, who gave, up, gave us Christ, all also give us everything else? Who dares accuse us whom God has chosen for his own? Will God? No. He is the one who has given us right standing with himself. Who then will condemn us? Will Christ Jesus? No. For he is the one who died for us and was raised to life for us and is sit sitting at the place of highest honor next to God pleading for us. Can anything separate us from Christ's love? Does it mean he no longer loves us if we have trouble or calamity or are persecuted or are hungry or cold or in danger or threatened with death? 
Even as the scriptures say, for your sake we are killed every day, we are being slaughtered like sheep. No. Despite all these things, overwhelming victory is ours through Christ who loved us. And I'm convinced that nothing can ever separate us from his love. Death can't and life can't. Angels can't and the demons can't. Our fears for today, our worries for tomorrow, about tomorrow, and even the powers of hell cannot keep God's love away. Whether we are high above the sky or in the deepest ocean, nothing in all creation will ever be able to separate us from the love of God that is revealed in Christ Jesus, our Lord. We live to honor worship, praise, respect, and reverence the Lord Jesus Christ. That is our calling, and that is our ultimate joy. Our goal in this life, in living on purpose, is to bring Him maximum glory. And we do that by living courageously, by living sacrificially, by living humbly, and by living reverently. We live at peace. We live a quietness of soul. We live unagitated, even when the whole world around us seeks to agitate us. Peter said it best. They will look at your behavior and they will be ashamed, but they will know that God is in your midst. So may the Lord cause each of us to see that he has enabled us to live reverently by simply following his design for our lives. His design as a man, his design as a woman. May you live that way this week. Let's pray. Father, thank you again for your design for our lives. It is best. Lord, at times we fight it, thinking we know what's best. Lord, we acknowledge, admit that we don't. As men and as women created in your image to reflect your glory, Lord, may we press in to who we are in Christ and to live that way triumphantly because we know that nothing can separate us from our from your love thank you lord jesus for providing for us setting the example for us and reflecting god for us may we follow your example in your name we pray amen